nature of the big cats is contradictory, enigmatic. They are both ferocious killers and the gentlest and most loving of creatures. In a split second, their temperament can flash from sensuous feline to ruthless hunter. They are superbly equipped for the hunt. Yet with each passing year, the range of the big cats diminishes. And in remote corners of the earth, they make their last stand to survive in the wild. Mike Farrell. Welcome to the best of the National Geographic specials. With each of these programs in the highly acclaimed series from the National Geographic Society, we embark on a richly rewarding adventure. Explore with us man's continuing quest for our world's hidden wonders, its enduring beauty and drama. Like the best of adventures, our journey of discovery ultimately takes us to a deeper understanding of ourselves. Are there any other beasts in all the animal kingdom that inspire such deep ambivalence as the big cats? Even as we're drawn to their supple grace and noble beauty, we're frightened away by their terrible ferocity and ruthless power. Our program explores the behavioral mysteries of these vanishing predators, from the lions of Africa's Serengeti to the endangered Siberian tiger, from the elusive cougar of North America to the few remaining Asiatic lions of India. We'll look at the uneasy truce we've established with these awesome creatures. Come with us as we roam the globe in pursuit of the big cats. Preserved in the Serengeti Plain of Africa is a vision of the distant past when big cats ranged freely across five continents. Each of the great cats of Africa has perfected different skills for survival. Strength, stealth, speed, and cunning. The powerful lion defends his territory from his only challengers, his own kind. The silent leopard stalks by day and night. Its vice-like jaws can lift a 200-pound kill high beyond the reach of scavengers. sacrificed strength for speed. Its attack velocity approaches 70 miles an hour. Once the chase begins, few prey can escape the fastest predator on land. In wildlife parks like the Serengeti, the big cats live protected from the threat of human interference. Beyond the boundaries of the African preserves, the lion, leopard, and cheetah cling to a broad range south of the Sahara. But other big cats are more seriously endangered. The Siberian tiger once roamed a vast domain. Now this largest of all the big cats has been hunted to the verge of extinction. There are no reliable estimates how many Siberian tigers still inhabit the no-man's land along the Russian-Chinese border. <laughs> Russian hunters close in on a young tiger they hope to capture alive to preserve the species in captivity. Oh, my God. 
Куда полез? Куда полез? Прижимай, прижимай. The zoo in Łódź, Poland, is an important center for the breeding of Siberian tigers in captivity, a necessity if this species is to survive. These two cubs were born in a cage. The only home they have ever known is a barred cell five yards square. They have never experienced the snow and ice of their natural habitat. A veterinarian must examine the Siberian tigers before they are shipped to a new home. The 50-pound cats are already so dangerous that each must be handled separately. Even for three men, it is a formidable task. The transfer of an endangered species from east to west is a complex project requiring weeks of negotiation and planning. In late fall, the two Siberian tiger cubs can at last begin a journey to a special destination, a refuge in Sweden resembling their natural habitat. The cubs leave the only world they have ever known, the zoo where they were born and raised. Polish port of Swinowija, the cubs are shipped north across the Baltic Sea. <laughs> On arrival in Sweden, the fragile cargo is unloaded by anxious zoo officials. Park epitomizes a whole new concept in zoos. There is space for creatures to thrive in captivity in settings carefully designed to resemble their natural habitat. The Pride of Colmorden is a collection of 11 full-grown Bengal tigers. Though native to the tropics, the Bengals readily adapt to the brisk climate of Sweden. The two new arrivals will be the only Siberian tigers at Colmorden. The cubs must undergo quarantine before they can enter the natural environment enjoyed by the other big cats. Winter comes to Colmorden, and the Bengal tigers thrive in the snow. After quarantine, the two Siberian cubs are set free. For the first time in their lives, they experience the outdoors. Cautiously, they test out their footing on unfamiliar substances, snow and ice. Thank you. 
Today, there are probably more Siberian tigers in captivity than in the wild. Zoos may not be the ultimate solution to the plight of the cat, but here at least the cubs are not imprisoned. They will have room to grow in a world without bars. The Idaho primitive area. One million acres of protected American wilderness. A vast rangeland for herds of the big game that once roamed the American West. Among its natural prey, lives a secretive big cat that has been known by many names. Mountain lion, cougar, puma, screamer, king cat. An age-old victim of fear and superstition, the shadowy mountain lion is so elusive, it has also been called the American ghost. Central Idaho are the setting for an unusual wildlife project. For four years, Morris Hornocker, scientist and outdoorsman, has captured mountain lions and collared them with miniature radio transmitters. The locations of five of the big cats can now be pinpointed from the air. Signals received on a directional antenna enable Hornocker to track the mountain lions. By mapping their territories and recording their movements, he probes the mysteries of this secret of big cat. Each year with the coming of winter, Hornocker flies deep into the mountain lion's territory to continue his study at close range. First, he must contact his longtime friend and partner, Wilbur Wiles, a skilled tracker and mountain man. Living in complete isolation, Wilbur Wiles has no radio or telephone. He can only be reached by a message dropped from the air. The message tells Wilbur to rendezvous with Hornocker at Cave Creek Camp, 15 miles away. For over a century, a mountain lion was worth more dead than alive. States offered up to $75 a head to rid themselves of the devil cat. The cougar was branded as vermin, a threat to game and livestock. The cat's notorious reputation has yet to be laid to rest. Down at, <laughs> at Cave Creek Camp, two old friends meet. They swap stories of their close calls studying the mountain lion and affirm a commitment they have shared. <laughs> well, Wilbur's lived in uh, the Idaho primitive area some 35 years now. He could give us the kind of head start that we needed on this project by getting us on to the cats. For more than 100 years, the uh, only way that cougars have been studied is over the barrel of a gun. We wanted to find out just how much a threat the lion really was. Redbone cougar hounds are the tested backwoods method of tracking the big cats. Since they were puppies, the dogs have been trained to detect the faintest trace of the cougar's scent in the crisp mountain air. They pick up radio signals. It's a mountain lion they call it with a transmitter three years before. 
I bet you she's spooked. Get her? I'll get a line this way. Right in line with that tree there, that fir. One blower one? Yeah. Using radio directional receivers, the men follow the signal. Its specific pulse rate and frequency indicate they're tracking an old male they have nicknamed Hotfoot. Because the signal is stationary, Hornocker suspects that Hotfoot may be feeding at the site of a kill. Well, he must be just right down here. I get a definite null here, and it's, but it's very weak. Hotfoot is dead, his radio collar still transmitting. Too old and too weak to capture prey, the cougar died of starvation. Well, through the years, we've learned the big cats don't always come out on top. Life isn't really all that easy for them. An old animal like Hotfoot here just couldn't make it this winter. I wonder who will move in here, into his territory. Hornocker's research indicates that Hotfoot shared his territory with Old Bess, a female. With Hotfoot dead, Hornocker is eager to find out how Bess has fared this winter. He maps out a search pattern that will crisscross her range of approximately 25 square miles. Late morning, five miles from camp, the hounds pick up a fresh scent. Looks like a straight fresh there. Looks pretty fresh. The men discover a cougar scrape. Pine needles a mountain lion has scraped together and sprayed with urine to mark its territory. Dogs seem to be getting quite a little scent now. Must not be over two or three days old. I think it's fresher than that, the way these dogs are acting. The dogs were really excited, and we knew we were getting pretty close to the cat. I turned the radio on, and we were just right on top of her. We had to be careful now, or we'd be chasing her several miles and probably into the dark. Hey, shut up. Be quiet. Just right, right through there. I don't know whether we can get down through here or not. study the cats, we have to get them in hand. And to do this, we use tranquilizer drugs. This is far kinder to the animal and is the only safe way of ensuring the cat isn't hurt or that we aren't hurt. Here, where he goes. Shut up. 
The hounds treed Bess again, and we discovered that two kittens were in the tree with her, her kittens. They were about five months old, and Wilbur and I were probably the first uh, humans they had ever laid eyes on. There's no way you can study a cougar up in a tree. Approaching an animal the size of old Bess 60 feet above the ground uh, can be, uh, well, it can have its anxious moments. <laughs> before the tranquilizer wears off, the men conduct an exhaustive physical examination. Small clues reveal the cougar's struggle for survival in the past year. A fresh scar, a ragged claw, or chipped tooth prove the mountain lion is not the deadly hunter of legend. Sometimes she comes off second best, wounded in an attack on an elk. At most, a lone cougar will kill only one deer every two or three weeks. She's, she's just a young, vigorous cat. She's a young cat. This is probably the first litter. Well, we know it is. Well, sweetheart. Sure, pretty little. Yeah. Well, often people ask, why are you chasing these fine animals with dogs and drugging them and all of this? Uh, it's the only way that we can gather the kind of information that's necessary to preserve the species. We've learned that the lion is not nearly the menace to big game herds as he was once thought to be. We've got the information and people are beginning to listen. This is one of the few big cats I think is going to make it. of Sasangir is a whistle stop in northwest India. Since the turn of the century, the population of the region has more than tripled. Man and animal alike face the intense pressures of overcrowding. Sasangir is on the edge of the Gir forest, a wildlife refuge protected by the Indian government. A skilled shikari ranger, Bana Qatar, works to preserve a breed of big cat native to the gear, the Asiatic lion. Each day before he ventures into the forest, Bana seeks strength from the Hindu goddess, Bahuchara. The gear is a last vestige of forest remaining in northwest India. 500 square miles of dry scrub and stunted teak. It is a meager final habitat for one of the rarest of the big cats. In ancient times, the Asiatic lion ranged from Greece to central India. Today, this endangered predator exists only in the tiny forest of the gear. The Gir Forest was once the private hunting preserve of a Muslim prince. Now a wildlife sanctuary, it is patrolled by shikari rangers. Oh, 
over the years, a bond of mutual respect has grown between Bana and the lions in his trust. They allow him to observe their world, even to enter it. The shikaris are the guardians of some of the least known of the big cats. In appearance, the Asiatic lion closely resembles its African cousin. But this far rarer breed has its own distinct history. It is the big cat immortalized in the Bible, the majestic lion of Judah that symbolized nobility and courage. noonday heat is part of the 20 hours a day the lions spend resting. <coughs> At twilight, the pride grows restless. The bond of trust between lion and shikari is strained, but the rangers continue their work. Through counts conducted at water holes, the shikaris have determined that less than 200 Asiatic lions survive in the wild. The men bring a goat with them as a precaution. It is part of shikari lore that if a lion were to charge them unexpectedly, the big cat would attack the goat rather than the men. At the end of their rounds, the shikaris check the condition of a sick lion they affectionately call Bilia. The old male is too weak to hunt for himself. So each day the shikaris have left meat with medicine in it. Today the meat is untouched. The men keep their distance. Instead of taking the meat, the lion has charged live prey. The men have been caught off guard, and only the goat protected them from Bilia's attack. The shikaris will not return again. The old lion is once more ready to stalk his natural prey. In India's Gear Forest, the drama of survival is acted out in late afternoon, after the blazing heat of day is passed. As they approach a waterhole, spotted deer are skittish and wary, alert for silent, unseen predators. Asiatic lion is losing his ability to hunt the spotted deer. He relies instead on easier prey, domesticated water buffalo. 
The buffalo belonged to Maldhari herdsmen, primitive people of the gear. The Maldharis treat each of their water buffalo with tender care, for they believe the Hindu god Shiva put them on earth for one purpose alone, to herd buffalo in the forest forever. For centuries, the Maldharis have peacefully shared the gear with the Asiatic lion. In search of food for their buffalo, they move deep into the territory of the big cats. The buffalo are safe from attack as long as men are nearby. The big cats bide their time, waiting patiently for strays to wander away from the herd. Members of the pride who made the kill can share the feast. New arrivals affirm their membership in the group by rubbing noses, a form of greeting. As they feed, each lion fends for itself. The weak must keep their distance until the strong have had their fill. In the strange ecology of the gear, the domesticated water buffalo has become the big cat's principal source of food. In the village of Wattersley, Maldharis churn buffalo milk to make ghee, a form of butter they sell as their sole source of livelihood. The Maldharis cultivate no crops. Without the buffalo milk provided by their herds, the village would starve. The death of a single milk buffalo can mean the loss of a third of a family's yearly income. They are the only things of value these people possess. Kama, a village elder, brings tragic news. A buffalo has been killed by lions. For the Maldharis, it is one of many such losses. Once the lion pride has eaten its fill, vultures squabble over the carcass. In the desperate world of the gear, no scrap of food is wasted. In the 1970s, the region surrounding the Gear Forest suffers the worst series of droughts since the turn of the century. To meet the emergency, the Indian government lifts the sanctuary status of the forest. The habitat of the Asiatic lion is no longer protected. Fifty thousand cattle invade the gear. They pour into the sanctuary from hundreds of miles around, trampling the forest underfoot. 
For weeks, the hordes of cattle range unchecked, devouring everything in their path. In spite of the devastation, the lions have enough food and water to survive. Though they can endure the 110 degree heat, the big cats are unaware that a far more drastic fate is imminent. Their last habitat is being torn apart. Invading cattle herds have gone, the people of the forest are desperate. To avert starvation, the Malharis must lop down the last branches of the trees. The leaves are the only food left to feed their hungry buffalo. The Malharis would never purposely harm the lions, but for their own survival, they are forced to sacrifice the forest of the gear. It may take 10 years or a generation, but the fate of the gear is inevitable. The forest will become a wasteland, a desert where it will be impossible for the water buffalo or the Asiatic lion to survive. Born in the parched spring of 1973, small cubs are nursed in seclusion from the rest of the pride. They are the Asiatic lion's fragile link with the future. These last Asiatic lions are the sole survivors of a majestic breed, the lion of the Old Testament the lion who shared his den with Daniel and chose to spare him. Today, the roles are reversed. The lion is at our mercy, and it may not be within man's power to assure its survival in the wild. The dense rainforest of the Amazon is the territory of the jaguar and the men who kill the big cat for its skin. It has taken this professional hunter weeks in the jungle to acquire the skins he will bring to market. To reach the nearest settlement, he journeys six hours through a labyrinth of waterways leading to the mainstream of the Amazon. Today, commerce in jaguar skins is forbidden by most South American countries. But the trade continues. Professional hunters know they can always find a market for their skins. No questions asked. In the early 1970s, 20,000 jaguar skins a year were brought to remote settlements like this one along the borders of Colombia, Brazil, and Peru. As long as a fashionable jaguar coat sells for $15,000, this big cat will never be safe in the wild. Jaguar skins can't be imported into the United States, but there is still a thriving market for them in Europe. The skin trade is often run by outsiders, merchants or speculators who came here to exploit this rich natural resource. The buyer, a European, is quick to explain how the skins are flawed, why he can't pay the hunter the best price. The hunter is eager to take what he can get. 
the equivalent of up to $200 a skin. The jaguar is so elusive, so little understood, that it is not even known how many exist. This big cat is seldom observed by man, except when he comes to kill it. The hunters push ever deeper into the interior, and the jaguar retreats in one of the last refuges on Earth for the big cats. We're happy to report that the future of the big cats in general is promising. In India, man and beast have both benefited from government programs designed to improve the lives of the Asiatic lion and the Malharis of the Gir forest area. India has brought a disastrous situation under control and the delicate balance of nature has been restored. Next time on the best of the National Geographic specials, we'll explore another corner of the endlessly rewarding and surprising world around us. I'm Mike Farrell for the National Geographic Society.